had the, which happens to have the right characteristics to become domesticated by us over time. And then one of the major arguments of this book is that some plants and animals in the world have you know, their properties or their characteristics are such that they can be domesticated. And other plants and animals just don't. We cannot domesticate them. Right? Nobody, you, know, you don't see anybody walking around in the US with an all eagle on their shoulder as a pet. Right? Those are just not domesticated. They can be. But you might see some with a dog or a cat. Those animals did have the characteristics, but they allowed them to be domesticated. Anyway, so the, 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 the sedentary agricultural lifestyle of our species began here. And what that meant was, although it was a much harder lifestyle, it did mean masses more food per acre than was possible anywhere else in the world. So you will not be surprised that the consequence of masses more food available in one place meant more people, population growth, massive population growth. And thus began a cycle that has continued to the present day. That is, when populations of uh, agriculturalists, or those who live on agricultural produce, when they come into contact or conflict with hunter-gatherers, they, the hunter-gatherers have a very tiny um, population, a very small density, because they have to cover a wide area to gather enough calories to live. Whereas the farmers can generate bajillions of calories in a very small area. Huge population. So guess who wins? It's, it's, it's a no-brainer. Whenever the agriculturists run, the, the, the hunter-gatherers get pushed back. So you might have some fantasy about you know, hunter-gatherers are cleverer, faster, can move through the forest better, and maybe have poisoned arrows. Yeah, okay, give them all that stuff. But numbers eventually, in the end, alas, always great. The gatherers have either been absorbed or killed or pushed out. So it started here, and this process of, um, of an agricultural existence spread. Not because it was good, not because it was better or preferable, but because the people who lived that way simply became massively more numerous. And they moved on and on. Into Europe and out of Asia and back down to Africa. And of course, the other thing we've domesticated apart from plants are animals. And of course, our friend Darwin was the first person to see the connection between the process of how people domesticate things and how we make new breeds or preserve breeds or shape breeds was analogous to how a species form in nature. So, I'm sure you're familiar with most of these uh, domesticated creatures. It's important to remember that they are, in a, in a sense, man-made. They're not animals that people found wandering around and just took them home <laughs> or built a little fence for them and sort of shooed them in there and they became ours. No. They have wild animal ancestors, sometimes extinct, sometimes still alive. And over time, because they were living enclosed or controlled by us, and of course we differentially kill some and preserve others, they changed over time and became domesticated. They lived with us. The first animal we domesticated was uh, it's now the dog, but originally it was either the wolf or a very close relative of the wolf that's now vanished. Now, you may, may not know that you can't have things like, say, a lion or a wolf as a pet, even though they're really cute, or some people think they are, because they do <coughs> and and they do yeah. Even one of the zoos and the circuses, like the obtained ones that are raised by people from the little pups or whatever, they still kill people. They're dangerous because they are not domesticated and tamed. They are a wild animal that's just kind of used to people. They're still a wild animal. A wolf, you cannot have a wolf as a pet. A lot of people have tried this. Do you know why? 
because wolves have a very aggressive social structure. They are trying to climb to the top of the ladder to be head of the pack. And they do that through force strength. So if the wolf is living in your household, and it's been a little puppy, and you know, anyone who's everyone's bigger, it's going to be, um, they, they sense that you're a dominant. But when the wolf gets big, <laughs> it's tougher than you. And it knows it. And they push it. They push the limits. So they will do things like grab you by the neck and hold you down, their teeth snarling, until you make the submission move. And then, okay, you and the wolf would then establish the hierarchy that wolf on top, you on the bottom. Because that's what, well, that's what they do in the, in the pack. And they all accept where they are in the ring. When the top ones come home, the other ones sort of put their tail between their legs and sort of make various gestures, meaning, I submit, I submit, I submit, don't bite my neck off. And domestic dogs are kind of doing some of the same body language when they walk up to you wagging their tails and so on. They are still using that body language saying, I submit, I submit, don't kill me. And, but we don't really usually read it that way. That's what they're doing. So that's why you can't keep a wild wolf. But over hundreds of years of perhaps um, some groups of wolves hanging out on the edge of human settlements, eating scraps, a bit more accustomed to humans nearby than most wolves are. Most wolves are. See humans over there run miles away. So there were probably some that followed our campsites and were quite accustomed to us as we were sort of uh, food scraps and so forth. And we probably began to raise some of their cubs because they are really cute and cuddly. And the ones, when they got bigger, started to snarl and bite and kill them. The ones that were naturally sweet and never tried which does sometimes happen, they would be the front, they would be the loser in wolf society. But as human pets, no, oh, we really like this one. It was nice, we bring more pets that one. It doesn't bite, doesn't snarl, it doesn't it try to climb the social ranking. So that has been bred out of dogs. But every once in a while it comes back. Every once in a while there's a dog that's really aggressive, that bites or injures people. What happens to it? It gets killed. So this filtering process has and it never ended. But what it did do was that over time it turned the wolf into the dog. And that's how we can keep dogs as pets. So they are now domesticated animals. They are a different animal than they were uh, in the time when they were. They're a different animal now than when they were wolves. So all, all of the dog breeds in the world, as you can see in this nice um, family tree diagram I ripped off for uh, Google recently, uh, are all commonly sent in the usual Darwinian way. Some dogs have been used as, you know, we use them for, uh, to help us hunting, to hear if there was danger nearby. We use them as nice warm blankets at night, to keep us warm, uh, just as pets to play with, and all the things that uh, humans have used them for. And of course the dogs benefited, because we gave them food. We still do. So it was a win situation for us, and a win situation for the dogs. Cats, on the other hand, are a mystery. Why are they, why are they put up with us? I don't know. <laughs> I'm still wondering about my cat. He's a complicated personality. Anyway, so, Diamond's other argument, um, which usually gets much less discussion, is that these societies of humans that had plants that they grew, that created annual food, and also animals from whom we got. Let's get, from whom we got. That uh, these um, societies could travel more easily uh, east west because of the same latitude, which is extremely important for plants and animals. You can grow a plant from the same latitude on far away in the other side of the world because it's the things that it needs like the uh, of the, the, uh, the the cycle of the seasons and so forth is the right timing for it. But if you move them too far north or south, it doesn't work and they can't live there. So that it was far easier for this kind of uh, new society to spread east and west than it was north and south. It would take maybe many centuries for your cattle or your crops to gradually be able to, to live in that valley just to the south 
where we live now. Maybe, maybe there are some people living there, but they're pretty poor, and their crops are rubbish, and they can barely survive. But maybe over generations, their crops finally adapt, and gradually it, things can march on the south. So that's his explanation for why it is Eurasia that becomes initially um, the first continent dominated by this new way of life. Eating most of the plants and animals, whereas in Africa and in the Americas, where the axis is not the south, such innovations in domesticating plants and animals that did happen there didn't go very far, or they or they went very slowly. And that does make sense, but it's something that most people don't remember. Okay. Here's a clip from a National Geographic documentary. Made about a uh, diamond's book about time came out. Just as a short clip about which animals have the right stuff. that we have domesticated, or many of them, are herd animals, in which the herd follows a dominant leader. And for those, it was possible for, for, the, for these creatures to live with us as if we were the dominant animal, the dominant member of the herd. And they got along quite nicely, thank you very much. They could live out their lives following the boss, as they have always had. Whereas, uh, but they weren't aggressive ladder climbers like wolves, with which we cannot tolerate something else trying to climb over us to be a top dog. Anyway, to be top of the pile. Same with the, also for example, cheetahs. People like cheetahs, but they've never been domesticated because apparently uh, not, they cannot be, they couldn't be bred in, in captivity because um, lady cheetahs are hard to get, I mean, literally. They require the males to chase them down at 60 miles per hour for a few miles before she decides, okay, he's pretty fit, I'll take him. Now you can't have a pen that's big enough for cheetahs to be running around at 50 miles per hour before the female decides, okay, yes, I'll mate with him. So that's the kind of animal that could never be domesticated. Whereas, say, chickens uh, were quite easy to domesticate. They, they get used to us, you can pen them up, 
and they just go about their business of clucking and laying eggs. So, what difference does it make? Lots. Domesticated animals provided the most powerful, the, the, the greatest source of non human energy in the world until the invention of the steam engine. Okay, I'm, I'm slightly accepting windmills there. Okay, windmills are also pretty cool. It's but in tiny areas. Anyway, but animal power was the greatest source of energy harnessed by human beings. They can pull plows, they can pull other things, they can help us build things, and so forth. Carry very heavy loads, they can trade of bulk um, products um, much more possible than it was before. So there you go. Ancient Egyptian uh, wall painting of someone plowing with cattle, and it's identical to what people have been doing uh, ever since. Similarly, animals give us um, hair or wool, or clothing, textiles, ropes, and thousands of other things. Milk, which of course can be made into cheese, yogurt, and a thousand other things. Um, and of course, their flesh, their bones, their hooves, and well, millions and millions of other animal products which we had in the gas supply. Leather, always there and available in huge quantities. So it was um, the result of living in this lifestyle that we got uh, massive populations for the first time in the history of our species. And then it meant that there was so much food that existed in these particular societies that there was enough surplus that lots of people could live who never touched a plow, or who never milked a cow, or did any of the other work. Specialists became possible. And they always did. Bureaucrats, government always arose. Kings, leaders, warlords, taking over all. Because now there was lots of stuff to have that existed now, that just didn't exist before. So some people became vastly rich and powerful and controlled others, and they got gangs of thugs, soon to be called armies, uh, to back them up and to do what they said. The taxation emerged for the first time. All those farmers had to pay a cut to the warlord, the top dog, the king, or the pharaoh, whoever it was. And so vast accumulations of wealth, but also um, specialists of other kinds, artists, musicians, priests, Sandal makers, I mean, just you know, all kinds of specialists became possible when not everyone has to spend their time gathering their own food. So the complexity of human societies has skyrocketed with the advent of this way of life. Monumental architecture began very shortly thereafter. The, um, the great pyramids of Giza and Egypt are still the largest structures ever created by the hands of man. And they were not built by slaves, as you see in the movies. I know it's fun to watch them. But I'm like, ah, oh, slaves. No, they were in fact, we know from the graffiti inside, they were built by work gangs who took pride in their section of the work. There was perhaps even a government subsidy program during the time of the year when, uh, when they weren't working in the fields. Because the government had all these vast coffers of wheat and so forth built up. The famine was part of their accumulations of wealth. So they paid workers to make gigantic things. Hunter gatherers had never built anything bigger than, well, maybe a small, a small um, ceremonial platform or something like that. So such structures and, and cities, living in cities, also came about at the same time. <coughs> And writing also was originated by these societies. Record keeping, and after that came lots of other things like uh, literature, poetry, love letters. In fact, the oldest letter in the world, I believe, this is so true, unless somebody discovered an older one. The oldest letter ever found is a love letter from a lady to her. Gentlemen, I cannot say it. what it says. It's not very plain. Um, but you can, you can Google it later if you can find it. But anyway, writing. So, writing it began uh, in the 
In the Middle East, they began for recording comments. So, for example, people would first use tokens to exchange one another. So, for example, let's say you owe me three sheep, then uh, we would exchange three little, I don't know, say three little cubes of clay, for example. Okay, and that stood for three sheep. That's where humans are intelligent, we can understand that these symbols just then they're abstract symbols. Or maybe they're even like a tiny sheep made of clay. It doesn't really matter. But the point is, they start off with little uh, three-dimensional symbols. And then you would wrap them in a, say you had a sheet of thin, wet clay, like the size of my hand or the size of a piece of paper, and you could wrap up the little symbols and uh, smear that clay shut and sealed, right? It's a done deal, or you, know, you, can't, you, you can't fake what's inside because we've sealed it together, something like that. When you open such a thing like that and dump out the little objects, what would you see? You would see indentations in the clay. In this particular case, you would see indentations of three cubes, or three little squares crunched into the clay. Over hundreds of years, they eventually dropped the cubes and just punched shapes into the clay. And that was the advent of cuneiform writing, which is the earliest writing system. What do you not on my slide? Okay, all I have is hieroglyphics. But in any case, so writing also gradually evolved and changed and either spread throughout these societies as well over the world, and sometimes just behind just learning that there was something called writing in the people who lived on, the, on that other island or in that other country was enough to inspire people, the one next door, to make one up. So they weren't always um, copies. But the alphabet that we still use today, which is, by the way, called the Roman alphabet, was invented by the Romans, it was invented by people in this part of the world, and was copied by one culture after another after another. It went to the Phoenicians, it went to the Etruscans, I don't know, it went to the Greeks, to the Romans, and so on. Painting all the while. And it's 2.5, so break time, five minutes. Knowledge of their being such a thing. Because in that case, you cannot, when you study the new one, you don't see, say, letters from the old one, and you can't tell uh, where it came from. But nevertheless, it's not independent. So, writing, per se, as a new invention, has not happened very many times in the history of the world. Other things have distributed around in similar ways new kinds oh. of metals. Such as um, first copper, and people could learn how to make bronze, later they learned how to make iron, and other things. Skills and innovations appear in one place. They don't appear over every, everywhere at the same time. They appear and then they are diffused from their uh, center of origination or invention and diffuse outwards depending on all sorts of variables and factors and constraints. So, for example, metallurgy might you know, move over the centuries across some continent, but only through advanced societies where you have people who can make stuff from metal. It's not going to go through a society of hunter-gatherers. They can't make, they can't have um, smithies hammering out sheets of metal when they have to spend all day gathering berries and killing birds and squirrels. So no. they, they can't pick up all those innovations. Sadly, they're still living in paradise. Okay. Okay, and here's one of the best understood groups. Uh, this is a, a recolonization, which human history is completely full of these waves of people for some reason originating in one region and moving outwards and, re and uh, occupying or displacing peoples who live in places around them. This happened over and over and over again. One of the most famous is called the Indo-European Expansion, which started somewhere around the Ukraine and um, around 2,000 years ago, and moving into Europe. So all of the languages and the peoples in Europe are descended from that ancestral time. That's why the uh, languages spoken in Europe, with a couple of exceptions, are all Indo-European languages. Now, you may have heard that English is a Germanic language. 
Yes, it is. But English, as German, and Italian, which is not a Germanic language, they're all Indo European languages. They're from this larger family. What happens is that you can also tell from the tiny exceptions where you have non Indo European speakers still surviving today, such as the Basques, who live between, in an area, a mountainous area between um, France and Spain. They speak a completely different language that is not related to Indo European at all. And what they are is like an island that remained after this, this tsunami of, in, of people moved in. I mean, I don't imagine this as like a, a war movie where they're all coming riding in on chariots or something. I mean, this is maybe taking centuries. But basically, these new people from the East, the Indo Europeans, they gradually displaced everyone else in Europe. But the Basques in their mountain stronghold uh, never succumbed. And they're still there. And they still speak. Um, what's that? So, if you go back 6,000 years, there were probably 10,000 languages spoken in Europe of many different origins, perhaps. All that diversity is gone because it was washed away by the uh, Indo European invaders. But then, once they settled down, once they were you know, each one in different valleys and different countries and, and so forth, their languages kept evolving. And evolved into languages that we recognize today. The Indo Europeans also went east into Iran and all the way to India. And this is how the Indo European language family was ultimately discovered. Because a uh, British scholar named Sir William Jones was working in uh, India in the late 18th century, and he was a linguist. And of course, like all educated people of his day and time, he knew classical Greek and Latin. I suppose he probably knew German and French as well. And he was studying Sanskrit. With his grasp of languages, he was astonished to discover the similarities between the classical language of India, Sanskrit, and the European languages. There were too many similarities. It could not possibly be coincidence. The roots of, of so many different words for so many different things like mother, brother, sheep, or whatever, were obviously the same. So these languages must have descended from a common parent. And that eventually was realized to be Indo-European, although the scholars who first named it were Germans, so they called it Indo-Germanic. But that was later changed to a slightly better term, Indo-European. So this is what the uh, this is a very very uh, abstract family tree of Indo European languages. I hope when you look at this, remember that tree I showed you uh, in the last lecture of the great apes. Remember which had you know, humans, gibbons, chimps, gorillas, and so forth, with just those few branches. Remember this is very that's a very stylized, simplified view, just for an overview. And then I just showed you. The fossil record for that little stretch between modern humans and the breakup of chimpanzee, just how, much, how many branches and different fossil forms existed in that one stretch. It's the same when you look at a linguistic family tree. This is greatly simplified. But nevertheless, it reveals the differential relatedness of all of these different languages and their ultimate origin in, in, that, in this earlier language, which we have reconstructed as Indo European based on the things that are shared and all these surviving daughter languages. So, there we are, modern books. Oh, there we are, modern English. And all of the other ones. Okay. Here's another one, the Austronesian expansion from around 1600 BC. This one is very interesting for lots of reasons, not least of which is because we're in the middle of it. This is an expansion of people coming from um, uh, southern China and Taiwan, going down through the Philippines, through um, Malaysia and Indonesia, and so forth. So all the peoples of this part of the world are distant, well, not so distantly related, and not that long ago. And they kept on migrating out into the islands of the Pacific, but they were peoples here before. In fact, it's almost always true to say there was somebody else here before them, because there were 
and there was probably somebody over here before them, and before them, and before them, and before them. People have constantly been moving around the space and so forth. So, um, I, I believe the Orang Asli in Malaysia are probably a remnant population of these pre Austronesians that used to live in this part of the world. Similarly, uh, in New Guinea, you see how this, the color is kind of skipped over New Guinea. New Guinea is still populated by the earlier uh, races, earlier inhabitants. Same with Australia. That's why Australians look so different from, say, Indonesians, because they're widely separate. Then these um, peoples, becoming great seafarers, began to gradually uh, colonize island after island out into the Pacific, and the, uh, eventually reaching um, and the society, sorry, the, um, the Pacific Islands, Hawaii reached uh, 1,600 years ago, just like all the others, right? This, every time human beings reached an island, there were loads of amazing, unique species, and we ate them all, and they're gone. And then happened in Hawaii and everywhere else. New Zealand, only 1,000. Not that long ago. Easter Island, 1,600 years ago. And I think you all know what happened to Easter Island. You know, not, they didn't just build those spooky statues. Uh, they chopped down, eventually, all the trees. They killed all the seabirds that used to nest there. And when they chopped down the last tree, they were stranded forever. They could never build a boat again. They could never leave the island. And their way of life, because they completely destroyed their environment, they chopped down all the trees, some of the tops were washed away, their um, agriculture was greatly impoverished. They became a rather sad uh, population, and of course, one of the most remote um, inhabited places in the world. But the Australians are from a much, much earlier region. They're from that original one. They've been there 40,000 years. Now, that's completely different from these days where you've got 1,000, 5,000. And one of the most bizarre or anomalous cases is Madagascar. No, I don't think anybody's yet figured out exactly how this happened. But the people in, in Madagascar, okay, right next to Africa, these people are not from Africa. I mean, originally, uh, or recently, I should say, they are ultimately, of course, but these people are related to, to the Malays, or the people of the Indonesians. Right? How did they get way over there? <laughs> because they're not living in all the continuous areas in between. So it must have been by sea. And they found a huge, Black Island, well, again, a big juicy fighter birds and other um, cute things which they ate, and a lot of those are not seen as well. So, here we get to the rum. Say by the year 1500, you know what we see in our era of 1500, uh, the world was very different now than it had been the start of the lecture, where I said everyone, everywhere in the world were all hunter gatherers. But this time, things are very, very different. There are still lots of parts of the world where hunter gatherers live, like the middle of the Amazon forest, lots of parts of uh, America, especially North America. Um, people are living in the hunter gatherer lifestyle like their ancestors have for the last, you know, 50,000 years. But not static. They're modern humans with identical intelligence and so forth. Just they have a different lifestyle, and maybe they're lucky enough to live in a land where they can still live the good old-fashioned way, where you can doze and take naps most of the day. That's what we all want to do. That's what you all want to be doing right now. If you want to be taking a nap, <laughs> but you're trying to listen to my lecture, but it's against your nature. I know it. I have just a student far longer than all of you. <laughs> It's in our nature. We just want to snooze and be lazy. And, well, that's what our ancestors were for 2,000 years. Until you got hungry, and then you had to go out for as long as it took to gather enough you know, tubers and berries and so forth. So, still lots of hunter gatherers, but then by 1500, there are hugely complex uh, societies with sophisticated technologies throughout the world, right? In Asia and in Europe. So, there's now gigantic. Um, inequality of population numbers and so forth. The crash, or the, I should say the crunch, or whatever, is about to come. 
I think the population of the world, so um, the world map squeezed into the shape of its various populations. You can see the Americas, tiny, except for a few little areas uh, where there was a slightly higher um, population. Whereas Eurasia is this big sort of, looks like a bit like a broken egg, doesn't it? But much greater populations because these peoples all not live from agriculture. It's bad, that's huge. Um, living from agriculture. And finally this, the killer. The advent of agricultural societies with much higher and denser populations resulted in something else. Oh, and also living in close proximity with all these new kinds of animals living with chickens, and ducks, and sheep, and goats, and horses, and cows, and all these things. And if it's not too delicate for me to hint, sometimes living too intimately with these farm animals, if you know what I mean, if you don't, um, I'm happy for you. But in any case, this close proximity to all these animals meant that human beings caught a lot more diseases than the hunter-gatherers ever did. Because, you know, we've all seen in the last few years, occasionally a nasty disease happens to jump the species barrier. It's not very often that, that diseases can do that, like Ebola, or whatever other ones have been in the news recently. And that's probably from wild animals, not from rats. So it's rare, quite for eating any. But when you live in a village where there's animal dung, everywhere on the ground, and you're all barefoot, and you step in crew every minute of every day, you've got maybe animals living in one end of your hut, in very close proximity, the opportunities for catching uh, other diseases are vastly increased. So ag agricultural societies with their dense populations get lots more diseases circulating in them. But those diseases evolve into a type that could never have existed in hunter-gatherer populations. That is the epidemic diseases, or crowd diseases. Nasty, nasty ones. Smallpox, measles, influenza, typhus, bubonic plague. These things kill unbelievable quantities of people. If such a disease were ever to arise in hunter-gatherer group, they'd all die. And they said, guess what? So with the disease. So that never happens. Or if it has happened, then everyone died. Or maybe one person would survive out of the whole tribe. And then you're as good as dead anyway. Whereas in vastly, um, uh, densely populated areas where people subsist in agriculture, the disease can sweep through and kill 20%, 30%, 40%, maybe 50% of the people. But the society has enough people that it just carries on going. And the disease can just keep on going from, from country to country to country. And maybe in 50 or 100 years, can circle back to the same city again. Guess what? Loads of freshly victims kill them all off, or kill lots of them off. But it can keep the disease itself and live and keep moving through dense populations. So, what happened over these thousands of years of agricultural society in Eurasia and in North Africa was that lots and lots of disgusting crowd diseases evolved. And over those thousands of years, Lots of immunities, or uh, immunity might be perhaps a stronger word. Um, resistance is the correct word. Lots of resistance evolved, right? The susceptible ones just kept getting killed. And the ones who could survive, these, these, uh, they would survive more often. So this is a new difference, a, a, a difference that evolved in these populations living in Eurasia. And that is the final part of the puzzle. The people from the old world, as we call Eurasia, high density, right? the largest populations of humans on Earth with the greatest technology, the greatest accumulations of food surpluses and material surpluses, wealth, and so forth, also were populations of people that experienced thousands of years of nasty diseases and built up lots of resistance. So when Columbus set sail for, by the way, he was saying, set sailing for um, the islands of Southeast Asia, 
He was trying to reach the Spice Islands, as they then thought, which were called the Indies, they thought, and of course ran into um, a new landmass that was not, not really known as though the Vikings hadn't actually been there beforehand. Um, the Americas in 1492. Oh, by the way, if anybody tells you that old story that in Columbus's day people thought the world was flat, you know that's not true, actually. right? <laughs> you said before. Do you still learn that in your, in your textbooks at school? Do they? Do they tell you that? That in Columbus's day people thought the world was flat and he proved that it was round? Do they tell you that? If they do, that's a myth. I hope they don't tell you that. Everyone in Columbus's day knew the world was round. And every educated person had known that for 2,000 years. Anyway, so he, he, didn't think that he didn't prove the world was round. He knew it was round. Everyone knew it was round. The thing is, he got his calculations very wrong and thought he could sail from Europe around to uh, Southeast Asia and on those little boats, which he couldn't. If America hadn't been there, they all would have died in the ocean. Or maybe they would have made it back alive. Because everyone else, his critics had the right estimate for the size of the Earth, which was there was no way he could sail all the way around with those with the ships. In any case, he and other Europeans discovered that their ships could just reach this other landmass, the Americas. And you know what happened next. Europeans began to um, enter the, the New World, or the, the Americas. And the, the result was the well, how else can one describe it? It's other than the, the greatest holocaust in the history of our species. The diseases being carried by all those Europeans infected the peoples living, even though agricultural ones, who, who say, for example, the Aztecs, or the Incas, they had very few plants and, and animals, so their populations were, were much, much smaller. They never, and they had very few domestic animals in the middle of the savanna. Uh, so they had never developed uh, a disease base the way that um, the Eurasians had. So the Eurasians came just chock full of nasty diseases. Hello, Americans. Kissy, kissy, and other things going on, and oof, they're all affected. And perhaps 80, maybe 90% of the inhabitants of the Americas over the next few hundred years were killed off by these diseases. It wasn't just that Europeans had swords and guns and, and, and so forth. It was their diseases. And the diseases moved inland far faster than the Europeans did. They killed off some societies that no Europeans ever saw because the diseases got there first and killed almost everyone and the few survivors probably dispersed. But the Europeans had lots of other advantages such as horses, these gigantic, powerful animals that can carry you all day, and that if you're riding against a mountain, people are very, very dangerous and intimidating. And of course, no one in America had ever seen a horse before. They thought they, these people had these giant monsters that they, they had never seen, that they could not imagine. So the clash was one that was extremely unequal in that sense. And so what happened? The cultures, the languages, the religions, the cities, the peoples, the traditions of almost everywhere in, in North and South America were destroyed and displaced by the invaders. Uh, in South America, it was more one of uh, mixing, so the people there still are uh, not more indigenous than the ones in the North America, but they're all Catholics and they speak Spanish. Almost none of their native languages survive. But it's the same, now it's, it's tempting to bash the Europeans in particular for this, because it was really a horrible, horrible thing. But it's always been happening. Every group of people that is far more numerous, far more powerful than, say, some uh, neighbors or some people they can reach, happens again and again. Invasion, displacement, take their lands, take their women, take their stuff. Over and over and over again. OK, so let's consider Jared Diamond's uh, thesis with the example of Australia. Okay. The Australians have been, the, uh, the average Australian peoples, have been there 40,000 years, living as hunter-gatherers. So, Diamond says, if you were a racist, you might say, well, they remained primitive and 
never built any cities, never you know, invented any high technologies, never made agriculture, never domesticated a single animal, and so forth, because, well, they're, they're stupid or something like that. I, I told you before, I don't actually believe that. Um, I think he's using that as a bit of a strong hand. But anyway, perhaps someone might think that. Diamond says, well, of course, it cannot be race, because you can, the Australians are just as clever as anyone else. And you can take an Australian baby, and you can raise them in China, or in New York, or wherever, and they grow up identical to everyone else. It's not the people. It's not the race. It's the environment. There simply were no plants or animals in Australia that had the right characteristics to be domesticated by anyone. Even to this day, with, with our amazing modern technology, we have only domesticated one species of Australian plant. Macadamia nuts. <laughs> you cannot build a, a giant society of people on macadamia nuts. You need something uh, with the right characteristics. You know, like wheat or rice. Something that can grow in large crops that doesn't take, you don't have to grow an entire tree for it and so forth. And these things simply did not exist there. Some of the, the large animals that exist when the Australians arrived, and there was a huge uh, mega fauna of large creatures that were extinguished by the first humans. Some of those may have had the characteristics that could have made them um, domesticable. But because they were encountered by hunter-gatherers who were catching them to eat, and they were gone so quickly, that experiment would never be tried. Whereas in other parts of the world, the encounter between the peoples and the animals that did become domesticated was a more gradual one. Whenever we arrived in a place, suddenly we kill everything. So we'll never know if any of those could have been domesticated. But I say, when people have been living alongside the wild jungle fowl, which by the way lives here in Singapore too, the ancestor of all chickens, all domestic poultry, um, descended from the wild jungle fowl that lives here in Southeast Asia, they was been living in the forest near people for thousands of years. And anyway, you, you can't really eradicate them, even if you try because they're little and they live in the forest. Whereas big lumbering things, like a moa, this gigantic plant is burned in New Zealand, you can't really hide those in the forest. And we killed all of them, we ate them, and they're gone. Maybe they could have been domesticated. Maybe they could have been you know, herds of cute mowers out of the fields, you know, a farmer with his mower herd. But never happened, because we ate them up too fast. Similarly, uh, so no domesticated plants or animals meant that the Australians continued to live as hunter-gatherers down until the, until the time when they were encountered by um, outsiders. And it's probably the case that there simply was, with, 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 their, with the technology available to pre-modern uh, pre, uh, age peoples, the hunter-gatherer culture and lifestyle was no doubt the best for that environment. After all, they lived in places that none of you could live. I could plunk any of you out in the middle of the outback, and I'm sure you'd die in a day or two. Where the Aboriginals were doing just fine there for thousands of years. The first Europeans who tried to walk across Australia to map it, they all died because they didn't know how to live out there. They didn't have the knowledge and the skills of the local plants and, and all the other tricks, the spiral tricks specific to that environment. So it's not that they, that they were stupid, but there was, there was no materials available to domesticate, to change their way of life. So it was what was available. Uh, in the natural environment already. Here's another video clip from, uh, from that documentary, which I think you find rather amusing. He's just been... Malaysia and Singapore are among the richest and most dynamic economies in the world. Like Africa, they are tropical countries with the same problems of geography and health, the same endemic malaria. But both transform themselves by understanding their environment. 
50 years ago, these countries realized the burden that geography and germs could be. <laughs> Through concerted effort, they managed to almost entirely eradicate malaria from their land, transforming their economies and way of life. The story of Malaysia and Singapore shows what an understanding of geography and history can do. Explanations give you power. They give you the power to change. They tell us what happened in the past and why. And we can use that knowledge to make different things happen in the future. The government of Zambia agrees. They have set up a nationwide project. Sorry, that, yeah, that's the end of the clip. Okay, so the... Um, the force of his argument is that people made up their societies what they could based only on what was around them. It's not the Australians' fault that they didn't build big cities and, and, and uh, vast armies and fleets of ships and so on. That just happened in a place where there was no materials to do any of that. On the flip side, of course, you could say, well, for 40,000 years they had no war. None of the rest of us will ever <laughs> match that record. Then again, hunter gatherers don't have large scale wars. They cannot support armies because armies are specialists. They are people who are not collecting their own food. Armies are fed by food made by farmers. So, no great inequality. But at the same time, hunter gatherer lifestyle is all just paradise, as I've been kind of joking. Actually, it turns out that they do live quite a brutal lifestyle. There's lots of revenge killings, and they live in a state of almost perpetual warfare themselves almost constantly going off to raid people on the, say, the other side of the mountain or the other valley, steal some of their women, club some of the men to them, uh, isolated, and then run back home. And then those people come and do the same thing a couple of weeks later. The, the, the rate of, de of um, death by murder in such societies far exceeds anything in the modern world, except for some hunter-gatherers who still survive today. Whereas in the um, denser um, agricultural states, you tend to have centralized power, and violence is controlled by the state. The state says, no, only we can chop off your head. You can chop off their heads. And hence punishments and laws and so forth were instituted in those kinds of societies. So here's the big question for today that you may never ask yourself this, but think about it. Why was it that Europeans got in wooden ships with their steel swords and their guns and steel armor, sailed over to America and got out and started taking over the place. Why wasn't it a bunch of Aztecs or Incas or Mayans jumping in their ships, sailing over to Spain or Britain and conquering it? This is such a fundamental question that it is always overlooked. No one ever even thinks about it. Why wasn't it the other way around? And I, I know of no better answer than the type of answer that Diamond gives. That all of these things available to the peoples in Eurasia allow them to develop denser populations, more complex societies, but ultimately um, Ultimately, those low societies evolved um, greater technologies and so forth. But I hope some of you are skeptical and saying, well, yes, that works fine for America versus Eurasia, and say Eurasia versus Australia. But what about Europe versus China? Just, you know, what, what? Here, I think. Diamond's type of explanation or type of thinking no longer works, even though in his book he goes all the way to try and do so, and I think he starts grabbing at all sorts of local explanations. I think his kind of explanation works well on the grand sweep where he began the last 13,000 years of human history. When he starts to get to the, to the point of this, well, I think you should stand back and say, well, look, whether it was China or Europe is the nitty gritty. The fact that it was going to be peoples from Eurasia, we have explained that. We can understand that. But I don't think you can use the same uh, criteria, the same arguments, and understanding 
to explain why it should be one part of that than another. But he tries, <laughs> and I don't think it works. Why shouldn't it have been China? China, after all, was a far more advanced society. The Chinese were writing poetry when the Europeans were still painting their faces blue in a cave. It's true. Um, so I don't think that, anyway, he argues that, again, he tries to use environmental factors. He argues that, the, um, that China is less geographically differentiated and came under the rule of a central figure very early in its history. And it's mostly been centrally ruled since then, under emperors and so forth, with a few exceptions. And that these uh, small number of people have the power to make decisions that would affect the whole thing. So he uses the example of the huge treasure fleets that China built, the biggest wooden ships uh, ever built anywhere in the world, sailed all over the place, they were amazing, and then change of government, somebody said, uh, get rid of those. And they were got rid of. And then after 20 or 30 years, the people who knew how to make that sort of stuff were dead. And that tradition was gone. Whereas in Europe, where you have lots of mountain ranges and rivers, and it's all divided up into lots and lots of little countries and, and, and languages and so forth, that's never been united. Not even by the Romans, and not even by the European Union. They're still trying to get it to work today. It's all divided up. Okay? Any deciding figure or government or power in any one of those places would say, get rid of the ships. I hate ships. And it will be done. But ships will not vanish from that part of the world because all the other countries have them. Or say, the decision might be, I think guns and cannons are cowardly. They detract from the nobility of our knights. Get rid of them. Okay, they can be got rid of. But all the other countries won't do that. So that technology won't vanish because of the decisions of one government or one deciding power. Because there's lots of competitors. So one or two can get rid of something, but the others will keep it if it's advantageous. And ultimately, that technology will prevail. That's his argument. Um, I'm just, just not entirely convinced that it works about why should it be China rather than the other island. I think we need somebody else to write a different book that's not um, based on the, the criteria that Jared Diamond uses for the last thing. I think he should have been content with sort of saying, look, the broad brush picture of how uh, human history worked out the way that it did, just down to the level of continent, I can explain like this, based on the, the properties of the plants and animals that lived in those areas, or where they could naturally be spread to, based on natural constraints. But when he gets down to nitty gritty, I just don't think it works. So as I mentioned at the beginning, uh, Diamond's work has been uh, widely criticized. Um, the most frequent one is its geographic determinism. In fact, when I first read this book, I mentioned it to my PhD supervisor at Cambridge, who's a very eminent historian. And I said, oh, I'm so excited about this book I read. All about the last 13,000 years of history. And I'm like, no, no, nothing's ever taken account of this before or explained any of this. And he said, mm -hmm. and he said isn't that just geographic determinism? And that was it. He just dismissed the whole book like that. Because he's, uh, he, he was an economic historian, and he dealt with you know, things on the level of government policy over the scale of 10 years or something like that. So this book talking about why human history went the way it did for 30,000 years, based on um, archaeology, paleobotany, and lots of scientific evidence, was just so outside his um, remit, his way of thinking, that just didn't consider it. But it's not just a history professor that then it would dismiss uh, Diamond's work. Many others, too, have said this. But I think it's not correct to call his uh, Diamond's theory or his work geographic determinism. I don't think he's saying that geographical factors determine. I think he's saying more like geographical factors uh, allow or permit things to develop, things to evolve, things to emerge in particular places rather than determining what direction they go. For example, the, thing, the differences between China and Europe. He couldn't really find any very convincing determinants there. 
Oh, and another review, you can Google it if you want. I found a review that's called Diamond's work, Academic Porn, which I'm not really sure what academic porn is, but it's obviously meant to be very rude. Um, so a critic on this book, and porn, I think that was a, an anthropologist. That's the view of people who think, who consider his work is treading on the toes of their field. And he's an outsider, they said. He doesn't know anything about our area. Uh, and they may be, you know, in many instances, they're probably right. Um, but anyway, that's the kind of thing that happens when a generalist comes along and offers a general explanation that covers over these specialisms of hundreds of academic specialists. They really hate it. So they say they say things like that. Um, and back then, my own view, as I've already said, uh, just a minute ago, that it, I think that it's, uh, there's a loss in it and if you keep it at the broad level of continents. In mean, the example of Australia, for example, or the Americas, can anyone ever come up with a better explanation? Why didn't the South Americans sort of say it over to Europe or say it over to China? You conquer them. Why wasn't it, why wasn't it the other way around? Now you might say, well, it just happened that way. You know, there's no real reason. If you reread human history again, it might work out differently than that huge society that developed in Mexico, or, uh, South America, or North America. They would go and conquer everyone else. That's fair enough to suggest that, but then we can say, well, it's is on and What would they be? What crops would their society be fueled by? And there are diamonds would trump you. There aren't any. There, we, there, are no, can't, there are no plants or animal species in any of those other places that can be domesticated even now. We've barely done, domesticated anything that was not done so by ancient peoples. Examples that have been domesticated in modern times are powerhouse species like the hamster. Um, you're all asleep today. The hamster? Okay, hamsters, it was one of the most recently domesticated things. What impact has that had on human societies? None. No, no great societies have been built based on herding hamsters. No great warriors have ridden into battle on the back of hamsters. Um, I don't know. People haven't caught horrible crowd diseases from hamsters. That, Okay, but they are from the they are from the New World, from South America, and there are a few other examples of that. Cute little things, or weird pets. A few things have been domesticated that were not domesticated by ancient peoples, but none of them. They are basically irrelevant. Okay, sorry for answer that. I don't mean to say that answers are relevant, but in terms of building a society based on them, they are. Whereas peoples who uh, who found themselves living in an environment where the ancestors of cows were, or the ancestors of chickens were, they had something there that something could be done with that. And that's not determinism. I don't think it is, anyway. It means that such things could be made use of by those peoples over time. Whereas people in other, please, people in other countries that just simply didn't have access, that such things did not live there, what could they ever have done to make a large, dense society? Based on what? Eating what? Riding what? There's no other candidates. Anyway, so read the, check out the reading, make up your uh, own minds, and ready yourselves for the final lecture uh, this Thursday. Okay, that's it. Okay.